Hi, everyone. Welcome to Waste 360's Nothing Wasted podcast. On every episode, we invite the most interesting people in waste, recycling, and organics to sit down with us and chat candidly about their thoughts, their work, this unique industry, and so much more. So thanks for listening and enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. This is Liz Bothwell from Waste 360, and I'm with Aidan Moat from Hazel Technology. Hazel's suite of technologies was developed to protect quality shelf life of produce throughout the entire supply chain. Welcome, Aidan. Thanks for being on the show today. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So please tell us a bit about your background and how you found your way to Hazel. Sure. Um, I did my, my background is largely in chemistry. I did my uh, PhD at Northwestern in 2016. So we, uh, we started the company in 2015, myself and, and several other co-founders from various other programs at, at Northwestern University. Um, I, uh, I was not in any way an agricultural scientist, but uh, I would say that my PhD touched on matters of, of sustainability chemistry. So at the time, I was trying to develop uh, new catalytic systems to convert renewable feedstocks into platform chemicals, um, sort of the, the other side of the, uh, the clean energy equation is as we you know, use less gasoline and as we use less um, fuels derived from petroleum sources, we also end up with shortages of critical platform chemicals like ethylene and butadiene, things that we make plastic and rubber, et cetera, et cetera, out of. So if we can't figure out a way to convert, you know, say, bioalcohol uh, into a similar feedstock, then we find ourselves in a material shortage even as we greenify our fuel system. So that, I was involved in that for a while, and, and that led me to um, become a fellow for the Institute for Sustainability and Energy at Northwestern Eisen. So while I was at Eisen, I got a bit of a broader survey of, of challenges in sustainability in major world systems, and I sort of settled into a thesis at that time that if you look at most world verticals, energy, transportation, medicine, commerce, et cetera, we've had pretty disruptive changes to the, the normal course of business in each of those verticals in the last 30 years or so. But if you look at agriculture, it's a bit of a different story. Um, it's the largest business by volume on the planet. It's the only business that touches every single person on the planet every day of their lives. And I would actually argue that we are at the tail end of the last great revolution in agriculture, which to me was the creation of the Haber-Bosch process in the early uh, 20th century. It's how we convert nitrogen into ammonia. Uh, we use the ammonia to enrich fertilizers. Uh, we use those fertilizers to enhance our crop production. And to give you a sense of scale, it's estimated that that one chemical process is so important um, to our, our world around us today that it's, it's estimated that one out of every two people on the planet alive today is only alive because of calories generated by that process. So, you know, doubling the, the rate of population growth in the span of a century is a truly transformative event. Now we're left with the aftermath of it, which is that we have a food system focused on overproduction, uh, not efficiency, and we have a new frontier problem, and it's food waste. Uh, so I got very interested in that issue, um, the scale of which is, is similarly massive because uh, it scales with commercial agriculture. So about a third of everything that is produced on the planet each year goes to waste. Um, and in the era of climate change, you know, to sort of put a price tag on that, it contributes about 8 to 10 percent of all global greenhouse gas emissions on the planet. So if it was a country, <clears throat> it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases behind the U.S. and China. Very, very big problem. Um, I got very interested in the idea that chemistry was how we transformed the food supply the first time and saw that there might be an opportunity to leverage a, a cleaner and more sustainable category of biochemistry to try to harness the efficiency side of that equation. Um, and that was really the genesis of the idea behind Hazel Technologies. So myself and, and our other technical co-founder, uh, Dr. Adam Pressler, we got together and we came up with this idea of using scalable, sustainable, human and planet friendly materials to control the atmospheric chemistry of storage environments. We, we wanted to be able to do this in a way where we didn't require producers to change their existing 
practices. We didn't want them to build a whole new supply chain to accommodate a new technology. We wanted something drop-in that could service today's operations and simply add a new layer of technology to the existing supply chain where we could utilize that to control shelf life and perishable food. Um, so we have this sort of non-contact, non-invasive, uh, highly sustainable and scalable system that allows us to target specific challenges in perishable food shelf life by mitigating um, the, essentially the biochemistry of the atmosphere around that food. Um, and in doing so, you know, we target spoilage waste with the, the goal of, of eliminating it entirely and, and bringing us towards a zero waste food system. So that is the, the very long and circuitous answer to your question. <laughs> well, what a, an amazing journey. And what you said is fascinating because you're having such um, a great impact. And the fact that your technology is super easy to implement um, and easy to implement into supply chains. I, can you talk more about that and what it actually is and why it's so simple? Absolutely. I, I think the way that we look at it is that from the vision that we enabled, that we wanted to enable, it was critical to create a solution that didn't require, um, well, really two things, didn't require the reconfiguration of existing food chain systems because that's a very expensive proposition. It's also not clear how sustainable that transition would truly be because if you start to add in power requirements, if you start to add in engineering requirements, et cetera, et cetera, you really are, are adding things into your life cycle analysis that mean that it's much more difficult to get to a zero carbon footprint. Um, and, and, you know, and conversely, even more difficult to get to carbon savings. The other component of that is that <clears throat> I think it's a, a common misconception looking at the food system from an industrialized perspective, from a post-industrial perspective, that everywhere in the world, that is the state of commercial agriculture. Um, and the truth is that only a very minority of agricultural production occurs in post-industrial areas. So the U.S. is a major food producer, and we are indeed post-industrial, but if you were to go to many areas of Mexico, if you were to go to Honduras, if you were to go to the Central Asian Parliament, um, if you were to go to smallholder farms in China, et cetera, et cetera, the landscape of food production looks tremendously different. And this idea of taking Western-style uh, or, or really U.S.-centric-style industrialization and mechanizing more of the food supply chain in order to induce savings, I think is, is belies the idea that human capital remains one of the most valuable assets in most countries in the world. It, it just doesn't work out economically. And if it doesn't work out economically, it can't work out environmentally. So we were very, very passionate about ensuring that our solution could take root in as many places as possible without requiring them to invest in, in fancier engineering and more equipment and so forth and so on. In, in essence, we wanted a simpler solution to the problem. And what that comes down to is being able to cost effectively um, and with great precision control the, the, the fundamental biochemistry of metabolism uh, and other processes in perishable food. So uh, a great, I'll give you a great technical example just to keep this, like, just to make this less abstract, basically. One of our more popular products is um, what we call an inbox sachet. It's uh, about the size of a sugar packet. You know, it's like, uh, you know, an inch by an inch, something like that. It weighs about a quarter gram. And that uh, little sugar packet is sized to treat a master case of most categories of, of specialty crop weighing up to about 50 or 60 pounds. So, you know, very small footprint, um, relatively large amount of biomass that we can treat. And what that sachet does is when it's placed in the box, and, and any operator anywhere can put a sachet in a box, they don't have to um, perform any active chemistry, they don't have to, you know, have a machine do it, whatever, um, it begins to slowly emit uh, an active ingredient into the atmosphere around that produce. Um, and in this case, it's a, it's a, um, a compound referred to as an ethylene inhibitor. Uh, so ethylene is, a, is an aging hormone. It's released by most fruits and vegetables during the aging process. Uh, it triggers deleterious effects in the, the aging process of those fruits and vegetables that ultimately lead to spoilage, you know, loss of quality spoilage and, and uh, microbial activity. <clears throat> if we have a very small presence of an, of an ethylene inhibitor in the atmosphere around that food, we can effectively arrest those processes. We can take control of the metabolism uh, of those fruits and vegetables, and then we can extend shelf life during the storage and transit process from within the actual packed containers, 
uh, throughout the entire duration of that process. We, we provide the maximum amount of protection from end to end, uh, you know, from point of production to point of consumption. So the key features there are, you know, we don't treat on a one-to-one -one basis, meaning we don't have to treat every single piece of food as an individual object that requires uh, throughput, which means that we can access bulk scale, which is good. Um, we treat the atmosphere, not the food itself, so there's no new chemicals, there's no residue, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we are functionalizing existing spaces, boxes, containers, warehouses, et cetera, rather than requiring our customers to purchase new spaces uh, to utilize the technology. So those are the key features. That makes sense. And then with what you're talking about, do you, Aiden, do you find yourself partnering, partnering with certain types of produce companies? Does the sachet or, or the chemistry work better with certain produce? Yeah, I mean, you know, for example, we don't do any commodity crop, which I, I know probably is not in your definition of produce, but I like to make sure that we sort of set the boundaries. So we're not doing like grains, you know, corn, wheat, soy, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Those have a very different set of requirements for storage that, that, you know, we're not a particularly valuable operator in that space. Um, different categories of fruits and vegetables often require different um, biochemical approaches. So we have several different categories of active ingredient that we use uh, to target specific challenges in perishable shelf life. Ethylene inhibition is one category. Um, antimicrobial is another category, you know, retarding the, the speed and proliferation of, of molds and fungus and so forth. Um, Anti-sprouting is another category and so forth and so on. But between those various buckets of technology, we're able to cover a very wide range of fruits, vegetables, even including things you wouldn't traditionally think of, especially crops like root vegetables that have these sprouting type problems. And that product's coming out uh, next year, I believe. So we've adopted this kind of platform approach that does allow us to treat a very, very wide range. I think, I think more so than almost any other provider on the market today. Um, and really it becomes a question of form factor. How do we, how do we find the right sachet or pad or, or paper or whatever we need to do to fit the practices of that particular crop. And once we have that fit, uh, then we can we can go out there and we can sell that product. That's great. And then do you see potential applications for this to be used in other fresh foods like meat or fish? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's really the next frontier for us. Uh, so we started off in crop just because, well, you gotta start somewhere. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, and there's no shortage of issues in fresh crop, but, but, you know, looking at this idea of delivering, you know, high value, sustainable biochemistry through packaging type systems, uh, the next logical step, I think, is, say, cut proteins. And, and there's a microbial challenge in cut proteins where um, if we can overcome the proliferation of microbes on, on meats and fishes and so forth, um, we can uh, definitely extend best buy dates by four to six days. And, and there you have a, a pretty significant shelf life enhancement um, just from doing that kind of crossover. So, yeah, I mean, we ultimately have an interest in all categories of perishable food. We are, you know, we're only about six years old. We're at the start of our journey. Um, but I think that's going to be the next thing on the horizon. Oh, fantastic. And then what other environmental benefits are you seeing with Hazel that go beyond uh, reducing food waste? Yeah, well, I mean, so there's a direct calculus to be done <clears throat> on, you know, volume of food waste reduction leading to greenhouse gas reduction. So, for example, last year, um, we, we protected about 3.2 billion pounds of food. Uh, we ultimately saved, uh, I think, about, uh, I think the number is about 600 million pounds from going to waste. And, and then that, in turn, prevents the emission uh, of up to about 250,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalents. Um, you know, this year we're more than on track to double that, so we're going to treat around six and a half billion. Uh, we're going to save around 600,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalents. Um, so there's a, there is a direct environmental calculus to food waste uh, that is, is very, um, very important to keep an eye on. But there's also some other things that we're fairly excited about. So one is <clears throat> um, power use reduction. Uh, we, uh, our technologies enable our customers to use less stringent cold chain requirements to keep the same quality parameters, um, which in turn means, you know, less wattage per, per unit fruit or vegetable. Um, and so that comes with a net, uh, power savings and, and therefore also a net energy and carbon savings. Um, and then the other piece of it, I think is, is actually chemical load reduction. So I know it's kind of weird to think about, um, me sitting here and talking about biochemistry and saying, hey, look, we're going to deploy biochemistry and it's going to reduce the amount of chemicals in food. Um, but the truth is that post-harvest challenges are often overcome 
with the use of chemical pesticides, fungicides, plant growth regulators, et cetera, that are sprayed or fogged sort of immediately after harvest. Um, and then there are potential accumulation concerns after that. Not, not, you know, I'm not talking about anybody who's getting poisoned out there. I'm just saying that there is a, a non-zero quantity of chemical usage. And if you can use a system like ours atmospherically in the storage environments, you can eliminate the requirements that you have to do those kinds of sprays and fogs um, in the post-harvest time window. And so we actually, over time, expect to see a net reduction of chemical load in the food supply uh, as a result of the proliferation of our technology. So those are some of the other external benefits that, we, that we're seeing. Those are huge. And I also read that you and your team are fabulous at putting customers first and, and doing the, all that you can to help them succeed beyond, you know, working with you. Can you talk a little bit about what onboarding looks like for your customers at Hazel? Yeah, first of all, that's very high praise, so thank you very much. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we very much do. I mean, I, we have a, um, in our mission, vision, values document, uh, you know, we have sort of four core values and three of them stem out of the, the principal core value, which is really that we're customer centric. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer in solving market problems, not in, not in pushing my own agenda, not in pushing my own technology. I just want something that, that works for the people that need it. Um, so, yeah, we, uh, we, we're definitely what you would call a consultative sale company. What that really means is we view our customers as partners more than we view them as, as you know, just plain purchasers. There really isn't any such thing as an off the rack shelf life enhancement technology. Um, reason being is that every supply chain is, has got unique elements. It's, it's got its own length, it's got its own duration, you've got variable harvest timing, you've got variable harvest quality. Uh, let's say your buyers are retailers, well, they're gonna want different things in different seasons. Sometimes it comes from different geographies, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to be sensitive to that. And, and many of our customers are, are multinational. I mean, I, I have a hard time pointing to any particular U.S. company that we work with that doesn't also have some kind of sister company in, say, Mexico or Chile or Peru, where the other half of the North American growing cycle takes place, because we can only grow during the warm months in North America, they can only grow during the warm months in South America, and you put those two together and you have a complete economic cycle. So <clears throat> as a result, um, we find ourselves working I mean, hand in hand with our customers. I, I think we have our business development team is really, you know, part technical, part business development, and they spend their time with our customers designing the initial test outs to show where our technology is best applied in their supply chain to ensure that they're getting the right benefit from it, and then monitoring over time what benefits are they seeing, are they having unique challenges during the harvest cycle, and if so, how can we address that through um, optimizing our application for, for the pressures of that particular season? So at this point, we're old enough, we've seen, I mean, we've seen all kinds of examples. We've seen issues caused by hurricane, you get primary damage, then you get um, problems with the soil and the growing conditions for the next couple of years, and that causes a high degree of variability. We're seeing, we saw issues with, um, with uh, problems with climate uh, really as early as a couple of years ago already, um, issues in the U.S. stone fruit production environment and so forth. We've had to work specially with those customers uh, in order to ensure that they can maximize their yield. We've seen political issues. I mean, uh, in the in the Trump years, there was a huge kerfluffle when we first started imposing tariffs on China, um, and they basically refused to import U.S. cherries for the rest of the season. And that's a, that's a huge blow, and those customers saw uh, volumes literally cut in half and had to come up with alternative supply chain routes and so forth. And so we're, of course, there to say, hey, you know, we can help you figure out a way to transition this to domestic or, or find a new market and you can reach it because you can use this technology to help you out, um, stuff like that. So yeah, we've, I mean, we've seen every version of it and, and we stand by our customer sides. I mean, that's, that's what we're here for is they don't just buy the product. They, they, they buy a, a relationship that allows them to tell us what they need and allows us to come in and help them. That's great. And I'm sure by now, like you said, you've been doing this a little while and the data that you're um, getting is amazing. And you get to, I mean, you'll start to see trends and like you said, uh, deal with supply chain issues um, as they're happening and give options and <laughs> solutions. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. And it's, I, I would even go farther than that. I mean, I think, um, I think it's maybe a common perspective to think, you know, surely someone out there is collecting high quality uh, impartial waste data. And there's been a lot of efforts, right? So like, you know, the NRDC writes its reports and the FAO writes their reports and, and so forth and so on. But 
Um, there's also a lot of contradictory information in the market. So a great example is uh, <laughs> for, for the longest time, the FAO has said, hey, um, you know, we see two different patterns of waste. In post-industrial countries, we tend to see waste accumulate at the consumer end because the, the sorting and the picking and the packing practices are, are very strong at the farm gate end. Um, and then in pre-industrial countries, we typically see more wastage occur at the pre-farm gate and supply chain management side because the technologies aren't quite as sophisticated in, in those environments. Well, then a report came out a couple of years ago, it was from Santa Clara University, I think this was 2018, that said that uh, even in California, we're probably underestimating pre-farm gate waste by as much as three or four times. And so what that means then is you go, wait a minute, if, if we've drawn all these systematic conclusions based off of what data are reported, and here we're finding out that those data cannot possibly be accurate, then our entire picture of what food waste worldwide is skewed in terms of how we can you know, positively approach the market and solve the problem. So as we gather these data, we have the unique capacity to anonymize uh, so that our customers don't feel like they're being attacked for, for you know, understanding their supply chains and making better uh, their wastage. We have the ability to anonymize and aggregate those data into a truly high quality granular and round up data set about what's really happening with food waste in these key um, fresh crop uh, channels. And in doing so, yes, there's definitely a predictive element which makes us better at our job, but there's also a, a sustainability and ESG requirement for reporting, which says that we, we can actually look at that and sort of assess, yes, we're, we're leaving the planet in a better place than when we started. Um, and as, as far as I'm aware, there's no other company that's, that's actually doing that right now. So we end up possessing those data and we actually have to do some information sharing with it. Um, so I, I think that's the importance of it as well. Well, definitely. That data is so important. And like you said, I don't think a lot of people are doing that. So it's valuable. I would agree. And so, I mean, you talked a little bit about this, but um, do you have to switch your formula based on the size of the shipments or anything like that? Is there a lot of nuances with that? There are, it's, there's not a zero number of nuances. I mean, we, we, <laughs> we don't want to customize a product for every single new application. Mm -hmm. um, so I like to call it one size fits most. Uh, but we definitely do have to pay attention to the scale of the application, where the application is going, what type of crop or, or food we're treating, et cetera. And so, you know, we, we service right now, we're doing about 15 individual crops, give or take. And I think overall we have, you know, there's probably four or five different form factors per chemistry and um, usually between one and three formulations. So, you know, you do have some variability there. It's containable from a manufacturing perspective, but we do rely on our technical team to optimize for the specific application. So yeah, the answer is neither really yes nor no. Um, but for sure, we do have to do a lot of, of optimization to ensure that the customer is getting the best usage out of the formulation that we do select for them. Or absolutely. But like you said, it's templated enough that it's very, it's scalable and um, works. For yeah, them. yeah. We're, we have a very good handle on the production side of things. So, you know, where we have, no, nobody ever asks about like, hey, how's your chemical engineering going? But like, yeah, I mean, the <laughs> whole point is that we, we I mean, yeah, nobody cares. It's fine. That's, that's a company problem. Uh, but the whole point of it is that indeed, because we have such a sophisticated engineering process for the production, we can easily make those switch outs and not kill our, our ability to actually sell the product at a price that's reasonable. So, Gotcha. Okay. That's important. And then I know you're B2B, but have you moved into the B2C space at all yet? I mean, it seems like there's so many applications that could work. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Uh, <laughs> So we definitely have plans for a consumer product launch. And, and when you say have we moved into the B2C space at all, it's a very interesting way of forming the question because you could argue, no, we don't yet have a consumer product. But I, I would actually argue that, that, yeah, I mean, we're laying the groundwork for consumer recognition of the problem and of the awareness that, that we're trying to provide a solution that we think is compatible with the desires of the consumer market. So, you know, we've got retailers that are advertising the use of our products to their customers. You know, we've co-created SKUs of, of different product categories that are co-branded with our branding. Those get in front of the customers, and the customers are making purchasing decisions based off of 
whether or not our technology is, is being employed to more sustainably enhance the, the um, shelf life of their, of their food. And, you know, we view that as the, the rise on vetra, so to speak, of launching a consumer product, because we think that that creates the question that you just asked, right? Which is, hey, how do I get my hands on it? I want to use this. How do I get my hands on it? Um, and that's exactly what we're aiming for. So I think within the next couple of years, you'll see the consumer product launch. And we're, for right now, we're just trying to keep that communication channel open and, and build that awareness and, and, you know, build that market for ourselves. Absolutely. Well, you're definitely heading in the right direction there. And Thank then you. how about the pandemic? Can you talk a little bit about how that has affected your work? Oh, yeah. I mean, really, really it's a new world paradigm, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the near-term effects were pretty interesting. Luckily, we don't do a lot of food service uh, businesses, meaning, you know, folks that are supplying restaurants, because obviously in March of 2020, you know, within, that, within the first quarter after that, um, retail-focused food sales fell off like 70% relative to 2019 numbers. Um, but interestingly enough, fresh retail numbers, grocery retail numbers bounced up very high, uh, depending on the category, somewhere between about 20 and 40%. So the obvious, you know, the obvious conclusion there is people are not eating out as much, but they are definitely continuing to buy food and they're buying it from their grocery stores. I think we could all come to that conclusion, but you know, I feel important to point out the, the obvious. So, you know, our customers, some of them took hits. Uh, in their retail business, and that was very painful for them. There wasn't much we could do about that, but a lot of those same businesses went, you know, they, they decided they had to push more volume through their retail sales channels, and luckily there was more consumers there to buy, so we, we were there to help them with that. Um, logistics and shipping since then has been topsy-turvy in one direction or another, and so um, we, we have a lot of customers that are... Uh, really sort of playing this game between air shipment and water shipment. Well, you, I mean, I'm, you're probably fully aware of all the problems with the ports right now in the U.S. Uh, obviously, there's a global shipping backlog that's causing water shipment problems and, and price hikes. Um, at the same time, air shipment remains a very expensive option, and it can't be engaged in for most categories of crop. So customers need, you know, a little extra edge to ensure that they can hold their stuff as long as they need to hold their stuff um, and still be able to sell it with a reasonable guarantee of quality to their customers. And, and we've been there to help them with that process. So I, I liken our business to um, supply chain insurance. You know, whatever goes wrong, whether it's cold chain breaks, whether it's unexpected delays, whether it's unintentional crosstalk between different categories of produce that should never have been shipped together, et cetera, um, our product smooths out those bumps in the road and generally makes the outcome better regardless of the source of the supply chain interruption. And, and I think we've proven that a lot with our growth during the pandemic. And, and I've been very pleased, personally speaking, um, to be one of the solution providers out there in the market that's really helping customers with this very significant pain point right now. Oh, well, for sure. I mean, what a heck of a tagline, tag too, that would be Aiden right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, you know, we're we're doing the best we can. We grew our business grew two and a half x, you know, but you know, headcount and revenue this year, and wow. you know, and the reason for that, I think, is that hey, look, you know, pandemic is affecting people, but the, the truth is that that we're we're a solution. We're we're a real solution provider doing a service for the market that is that is necessary. And I think there's no better proof than that. And you know, I say that with no small amount of pride, uh, but that just says that we're doing what we need to be doing. No, absolutely. And challenge like this for people to become aware of solutions that companies like yours provide. So. Yeah, and that's always been important to us. I think that, and I love doing podcasts like this because I really love everybody that's out there trying to open communication channels between what can often be viewed as a very opaque and complicated food system on the supply side mm -hmm. with, you know, the stuff that you're putting in your body every day, which I think consumers have every right to 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 know and be inquisitive about that. And our perspective is that we view ourselves as stewards of the public conscience, meaning, you know, we, we want to be as transparent as humanly possible so that we don't commit any of the sins that have made people distrust their food over time. Um, and that requires us to be active participants in the conversation. And so I, I really love having the opportunity to talk about it. Oh, great. Well, it's, it's great to hear about it as well. And then on the business side, I know you're growing by leaps and bounds, like you said. How's the 
capital funding part of your world been going? <laughs> well, reasonably well, if you've seen the news this year. Um, <laughs> We, uh, we, yeah, we, we had some great, great fundraising this year. We raised about $70 million in our Series C uh, with some really impressive partners globally. Um, and, of course, the, you know, the idea there is that, that we've always viewed ourselves as, as needing to be a global company. And so this is a, a major step forward in building out our uh, international business presence. And, and, you know, we have the goal by 2025 of uh, basically taking the product into every major agronomic center on the planet. Um, and being commercialized there uh, to grow further business. So that's been going great. And, um, you know, I think that the, the appetite uh, that has emerged in the investor market for uh, not only sort of ESG positive companies, but, but really kind of specifically for actual climate change technologies and, and ESG technologies um, speaks very, very well of a market trend that is pointed firmly in the direction of making positive progress uh, all over the world for this for this type of thing. So, yep, I thank our investors dearly, uh, and we look forward to the next opportunity to engage with investors in that market. There's a lot of activity going on right now, and I think it's going in the right direction. It definitely is, and you're square, like you said, square in that sweet spot of being able to report on ESG and um, and sustainability. So um, Wall Street loves that right now. So investors. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the timing's impeccable. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, as, as I, I hate to take the words from him, but my colleague, Pat Flynn, one of, one of Hazel's co-founders, has a great line, and I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing, but he, he basically, whenever anybody asks him why did he join the company, um, he basically says, well, you know, any sufficiently big problem is an equally big opportunity. And clearly, this is the problem for the future, so this is the opportunity to get into. Absolutely. And and now that you're growing, you know, kind of along those lines, too, is, um, you know, you're you're in the business of reducing food waste. So there is a purpose uh, to your solution. Are you finding you're attracting people who are drawn to that type of company or are you still attracting sort of the scientists and, and um, those types of folks? How's it how's it looking from a, a setup um, of, of your people now? Well, I, I want to chide you a little bit and, and make sure that you understand that the scientists care too, you know? They, uh, well, they're, no, they're as I'm not. saying that, I, I was like, I better <laughs> rephrase. No, no, I'm, just, I'm, I'm totally teasing you. But, but no, it's, it's a really good question because, um, and I hate to frame it like this because I know that right now it's a seller's market and like everybody in the world is having a hard time getting top talent. But we've we've kind of played that game on easy mode because we're a pat, we're fundamentally a passion driven business. I mean, I I don't think I have a single employee that didn't sign up at Hazel, regardless of what their role is, from from the COO all the way down to you know lab technician. They didn't sign up with Hazel in some capacity because they wanted to be a part of the company's mission. Um, mm -hmm. And so for us, it's very very important that we keep our mission very streamlined, very focused on on positive change in the world. Um, because as a result, we've been able to attract what I would consider to be top tier talent. So almost solely on the basis of their passion. I mean, certainly we're a very good employer and we're very kind to our people, but like there's lots of good employers and they're very kind to their people too. And for us, I think the big differentiator is just that people really, really want to engage with this vision and they really want to solve the problem this way. Um, so it's, it's unbelievably important in every aspect of the company, scientists included. <laughs> and we love our scientists and I know they're very caring people. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you have to remember, I do have a PhD. I am part of that world. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I know my audience now. I uh, should have phrased that differently. So I did a lot of finding. <laughs> and so you mentioned that you're opening a facility in California. What, is, what will that look like? Yeah, so that, oh, it's going to be really cool, actually. Um, so we... Our, so we've got manufacturing facilities outside of California. We're, we're still almost entirely U.S. based on that front. But the Fresno facility, it'll be in Fresno, California, is uh, specifically targeted towards uh, the post-harvest science side of the company and um, will focus on interfacing directly with – I mean, basically, the customers are right down the street. So just interfacing directly with customers that are – right there in the heart of California, you know, the biggest producers in the United States, some of our best customers, and 
in addition to allowing us to to really increase the quality of our scientific output by putting us you know right smack dab in the middle of these supply chain logistics so that we can uh, really interface with and study the specific impacts of the supply chain as it interacts with our technology, um, we're also able to open up a little bit more and sort of show the customer more about what we do. So we're going to have a demo room in there. Uh, it'll not only showcase uh, application versions of our technology, but we're also going to have a tasting and uh, what we call an organoleptic room, meaning that um, customers can come in and eat things that have been treated and, and see differences in ongoing post-harvest trials and and you know really actually get a, a full qualitative and quantitative picture of, of what the scientific wing of Hazel Technologies can accomplish. And, uh, and I don't want to tell tales out of school because this hasn't fully been settled yet, but um, I have a little uh, penchant for turning food waste into distilled alcohol. <laughs> and um, we're going to be going through a lot of food there. So the current thinking is we're going to go ahead and build out a proper distillation setup there as well and have a little bit of the tasting room on that side also. Well, I think that's a must. Uh, yeah, I mean, come on. Well, I mean, once I say that, nobody is ever like, oh, that's a bad idea. You shouldn't do that. <laughs> And, you, and you, you said it now, it's recorded, you, you have to make it happen. I know, I, thought you were gonna, I knew you were going to ask me this question, and I was like, oh, should, I, should I talk about this still yet? I think it's going <laughs> to happen. I think it's going to be fun. That's, I feel I, I've got enough confidence in the project that we'll get it put together. I mean, the, the Hazel, the Hazel uh, holiday liquor bottle has become a bit of a customer tradition over the last few years, and I just, I just emptied a cask that uh, I put together like 30 months ago. Um, you know, for this year's customer offering. So at this point, people have come to expect it. I feel like people would get mad at me if I didn't. <laughs> oh, definitely. And I love that you've already been doing that. That's fabulous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, very small scale, relatively speaking. But, you know, part of the, the whole reason that that project emerged was because, you know, our, our post-harvest lab in Chicago, it goes through a couple hundred pounds of food a week, uh, depending on the experimental frequency. And, you know, we just don't want to waste that stuff. We, we, we tried to give a lot of it away. You can only give so much away. You can't give away damaged or bad fruit, but you can still ferment it. And so we said, all right, well, I don't want to waste this. You know, I don't want to waste these calories. Let's go ahead and turn it into something fun. And the, the post-harvest facility we'll have in Fresno will be, you know, 10x that. And so it just gives us a bigger opportunity to produce more. Um, and, and we'll have to do something fun with it. That's our responsibility is we have to do something fun with it. So uh, it's good. I think it'll be fun. I think we'll figure it out. Well, that's great. Well, keep us posted as you open that. That is, uh, I love how it's going to be. Absolutely. <laughs> and if you if you find yourself in Fresno, you know, email me or Pat or Kellen or somebody and ask <laughs> for a tour, and you can come by and you can get a tour and you can get some some a couple of drams. <laughs> Sounds good. Twist my arm. <laughs> <laughs> So, Aiden, is there anything else you want to share? I know you're a busy guy, but um, if I hadn't asked you something that you wanted to share, please let me know. I think this has been a, a very good interview. I mean, I think one thing that uh, that we we rarely get to talk about, but that I'm also very excited for, is you know we one of the one of the advantages our technology has is is one in terms of customer scale as well. So. Um, if you have to buy a piece of equipment that's, you know, a million dollars or two million dollars, you're not going to see a lot of smallholder farmers interacting with that kind of technology. Um, and it's, it's, this is a big problem in consolidation, not because big businesses are bad businesses, but because um, monocropping, uh, the, the evolution of, of monogenetic cultivars of, of various crops is becoming a bit of an issue worldwide. And um, you've probably uh, heard this in context in bananas. Uh, more recently than anything else, but uh, bananas, because now we really only have one commercial genetic cultivar of banana worldwide, are basically in danger of extinction um, from a variety of diseases uh, that are um, opportunistic for that particular cultivar, and we don't have a very robust banana horticulture uh, program to overcome that. So one thing that we're excited about is that because our technology doesn't require that kind of investment, uh, we can service any farmer anywhere from you know the smallest landholders up to these you know very very large companies that we often do business with, and I think that that in turn provides an opportunity for increasing the genetic diversity of our uh, dinner plate. Meaning that folks who can grow heirloom categories of fruits and vegetables can continue to gain market share and can continue to support their operations with uh, high quality shelf life technology without having to pay an arm and a leg for it, so it, it doesn't you know threaten the, their livelihood. Um, that in turn leads to a higher degree of genetic diversity, biodiversity in um, available foodstuffs. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of 
of heirloom everything, you know, I think that we need to keep that biodiversity alive as much as possible and, and sort of reduce the, the, um, the tendency towards consolidation of, of our uh, biological diversity in food. So I think that's something we're here to enable. And it's a bit of an esoteric subject, but I think it's one that could be incredibly important to the survival of, of very key fruit items like the banana. Um, and I'm proud to be kind of at the front of that, that technological innovation. Oh, definitely. I mean, it's critically important, especially the way that you phrase that. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you very much for your, for your time. I appreciate the interest. Uh, it was a lot of fun talking to you. Oh, you too. And please keep in touch as you build out your facility and, uh, you know, keep doing great things. Thanks for all the work you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, much okay. appreciated. Yeah, thanks very much for having me on. Okay, thanks, Aiden. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you for listening. It would mean the world if you would take a moment to rate or review this podcast. And if you share it with us on one of our social networks, we are giving out some fun, nothing wasted podcast swag. So just tag us and see what you get. Thanks so much.